Good evening, everybody, members, officers of the Council and members of the press and public. I welcome you to this meeting of the Council. If the fire alarm is activated, please vacate the offices via the stairs, either through the security doors to my right or opposite the lifts in the foyer. Please do not use the lifts. Please assemble in Hawley Square on the green and officers will assist you and advise when it is deemed safe to return to the chamber. The proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and subsequently broadcast on the internet. I would advise that if filming takes place, anyone in attendance in the public areas may have their image captured, and I would urge anyone filming proceedings to avoid filming members of the public, particularly if there are children present. I can see at least one camera, but may I formally ask, does anyone intend to film the meeting? Thank you very much. Any member of the public who objects to the possibility of film being filmed may wish to take this opportunity to leave the meeting. Any filming or recording will not be permitted for any item of business where exempt or confidential information is considered following the exclusion of the press and the public from the meeting. Would everyone present please ensure that their mobile phones are turned to silent and that they are not used to make or receive phone calls in the chamber whilst this meeting is in progress. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number one then, apologies for absence. We've received apologies from Councillor Ashby and from Councillor Howes. Are there any other apologies, please? Thank you, Councillor Game. Thank you very much. Agenda item number two concerning the minutes of the previous meeting which was held on the 12th of May 2016. There is an amendment I would like to draw members' attention to, a typographical error in the minutes at item 8B. Councillor Fairbrass should be referred to in that item as the deputy leader of the council, not as the leader. So subject... <laughs> Subject to that amendment, I move that the minutes of the meeting of this council held on the 14th of July 2016 be approved and signed as a correct record. Is there a seconder, please? Councillor Grove, I'll thank second. you very much. <coughs> Do members agree? Thank you. Agenda item number three, announcements. I'm sure uh, members would wish to join me in welcoming Councillor George Rosecki and Councillor Linda Piper to this meeting and to this council, and I offer you my congratulations on your recent elections. May I also take this opportunity to introduce you to Charlie Friedlander, who has taken over from Andrew Medlock, and she is seated here in front of us, having already exercised her power with the gavel and the hammer. Charlie, you're very welcome to this council. We look forward to uh, working with you. And for members' knowledge, I, Charlie has been uh, acting as uh, my attendant and driver on a few occasions already. Extremely professional woman. And thank you for coming to work with us. Agenda item number four, then, uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest that need to be made? Thank you. Agenda item number five, petitions to the council. 5A then is a petition containing 59 valid signatures which has been received by this council. And I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Murray to the meeting. Mr. Murray, could you please make your way to the top table? Thank you for coming, Mr. Murray. You have up to three minutes to present uh, your petition to the Council. Could I first thank you for seeing me for this petition. Can you ask yourself a question? Why a bus service bypasses two villages on its way to a major city locally? The answer is no reason at all. 
Let me fill you in with the reason for the risk crest for a change to the route of the number 9 Ramsgate to Canterbury bus. If you live in or near Minster or Moncton, the only way to use this, to use this bus is to walk to the Manor Hut at Cliff's End or to Saar. As the bus passes along the dual carriageway, bypassing Minster and Moncton. I myself and most of the residents of Moncton and Minster make the request for the route to change. From Canterbury, the bus would leave the main road and enter Moncton from the roundabout at the top of Willits Hill, then along to Minster. In Minster, at the corner of the new inn public house, it would turn up Tothill Street to the roundabout onto the dual carriageway it would then follow its original route to Ramsgate. It would reverse the route on its return to Canterbury. The two said villages access to Canterbury and Ramsgate. The only existing way is on the number 11 route that goes through Preston and Wingham to Canterbury. I think most would agree a bit of a round the houses route. The other way is at a train at a price of 580 single or 690 return. That's after 9 o'clock in the morning. A long walk from Moncton as well. The passing of a secondary school at Squires at Hurston make an easy substitute for the other schools in Thanet. And the university are making Canterbury shops accessible for, accessible for older and younger alike. And also families without cars and the possibilities of work for the old and young alike. I collected a fairly decent percentage of the residents' signatures without trying too hard, especially the residents of the Smuggler's Leap caravan site, as the bus stop at the top of Tothill Street would allow them a much-needed bus route to the said destinations. After all is said and done, this is meant to be a bus service, but it doesn't seem to be servicing the villages that it passes, just avoiding them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Murray. And in accordance with the Council's petition scheme, this petition will be referred to Cabinet without debate for report to the Council within three ordinary meetings. Agenda item 5B concerns a petition regarding the condemnation of racism, xenophobia and hate crimes across Thanet. A petition containing 340 valid signatures has been received by this council and I am pleased to welcome Mr Wright to the meeting. Mr Wright, could you please make your way to the top table? Thank you for coming. You have up to three minutes to speak on this petition. The signatories of this petition ask that you, as a representative body of the residents of Thanet, reconsider the decision to not support Amnesty International's statement presented by Councillor Iris Johnston at the last Council meeting condemning racism, xenophobia and hate crimes across the district. Hate crime has undeniably increased in our communities in conjunction with the EU vote. The figures released by the National Police Chiefs Council show that in the week following the referendum vote, the number of incidents rose by 58%. By the end of July, it was at 49% rise compared to the same point in 2015. Amnesty issued it in its Stand Against Hate campaign an urgent call on all local councils to condemn hate and to commit to ensuring that all local bodies and programmes have the support and resources needed to challenge it. So far, Thanet Council is the only council in the UK that has not supported the campaign. We believe this sends out a poor message and a poor image of the area. It also appears to breach the public, duty, public body equality duty to be positively proactive in preventing discrimination, which more specifically requires you have due regard to the need to foster good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. Hate crimes are acts of hostility by ignorant and impressionable minds where the perpetrator's prejudice of a protected group is the motivation. Such incidents have included the beating to death of a Polish man and the repeated kicking of a Muslim mother-to-be 
in her stomach, causing her to lose her unborn twins. This is the real and tangible extremism we have seen on our streets. But these acts don't take place in a vacuum. They are stimulated by a strong and persistent anti-migrant narrative in our media and in our political parties. It starts with the single belief that someone of a different race or religion is less worthy or a threat. The people affected by this corrosive narrative are our friends, our colleagues, there are people feeling unwelcome when someone says, oh, I didn't mean you, following a flippant comment ma made about migrants being a burden to our community. These are people we work alongside every day, enriching our services, friendship groups and families, and who contribute much more than mere economic value paid in taxes. And they deserve to be treated with the dignity and respect all human beings should be treated with. Where have we got to in the 21st century where people are viewed with contempt as merely objects of economic burden? If we're to truly change things, we need to start thinking and speaking of people as a benefit and not a burden. We call upon Thanet District Council to stand against hate, to state their opposition to race and xenophobia and hate crimes, ensure resources and continued support are available to do this, and to affirm their continuing intent for unity, compassion and understanding in order to ensure safe and more cohesive communities for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Wright. Thank you, Mr Wright. In accordance with the Council's petition scheme, the petition will be referred to Cabinet without debate for report to the Council within three ordinary meetings. Agenda item number six, questions from the press and public. There are no questions that have been received from members of the public in accordance with Council Procedure Rule number 13. Agenda item seven, questions from members of the Council. Would members now please refer to the supplementary agenda number one. Two questions have been received from members of the Council in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 14. 7A is a question in relation to the toilets at Minnis Bay, and I call upon Councillor Ken Gregory. Thank you, Chairman. Um, could Councillor Brim please tell me when the public toilets at Minnis Bay are next due or scheduled to be refurbished? Councillor Brim to respond, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the provision of public toilets, which is a non-statutory service, comes at an annual cost to the Council of £528,000, of which £20,000 is a sum allocated for fixtures and fittings, which is invariably used for general maintenance. As you can imagine, this sum does not take long to spend when considering uh, that we currently have 32 uh, sets of toilets to maintain in Thanet. The biggest single cost in the current financial was the provision of temporary toilets at Westbrook, which cost the authority £21,000. This was budgeted for separately on the same basis as a similar provision the preceding year. It is the intention of the Council to undertake a review of the provision of toilets in conjunction with the review of corporate assets and the asset management plan. Until this process concludes, no major works will be taking place on toilets as such, and in answering the, the specific question, there are currently no plans to refurbish the toilets at Minnis Bay at this point. Thank you. Councillor Gregory, do you have a supplementary question? Um, in that case, um, Councillor Brim, I wonder if you could answer me this. In Birchington, in Alpha Road car park, we have a set of toilets that have been shut for most of the summer for some reason or other. I notice the gentleman's side has been open in recent days, but what has resulted, because there have no, been no signs around the village to say they're shut, people have been rushing around there to go to the toilet and been unable to do so, and therefore have been urinating in public and worse in public. And recently, females have had to be using the gentleman's toilets and check that there's no one in there before they go, because the ladies were still shut, was the consideration of having portable or temporary toilets on the car park taken into account? Thank you. Brim, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Right, the toilets in uh, Birchington haven't been shut for most of the summer, and they have, there is a leak, and we are working on it. Um, we're currently, uh, we were trying to establish where the leak was from 
where the stop clock is, which is located on the corner of uh, Wanstall Court, and I think it's just less than 100 yards from that point. We've had a Cat and Jenny equipment out there, and I've been on site uh, while they've been Cat and Jennying it. They've dug up part of the road uh, to make some minor uh, observations. Now we intend to put a stop clock, which we've paid uh, Southern Water, and we're waiting for Clancy Dockra to actually, they've got a 21 day turnaround and then a week. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with agencies that just don't get things done at the drop of a hat, but we are on it and those toilets will be opened. In the meantime, we're saying uh, to the general public that the library have said that they're, when they're open, uh, residents of Birchington um, can use the toilets in the library. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brim and Councillor Gregory. Agenda item 7B then is a question in relation to the Royal Sands development. And I call upon Councillor Savage, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. On the 20th July 2016, Thanet District Council received £3 million from Cardi Ramsgate for the freehold of the site of the Royal Sands project. With the subsequent changes to the directorship of that company, can he provide us with an update that can satisfy concerns for the completion of the project within the time span agreed? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I call upon the leader to respond, please. Thank you, Councillor Savage. Uh, neither the change in the directors of Cardi Ramsgate Limited nor the subsequent change in the name of the company to Ramsgate Development Company Limited makes any difference to the enforceability of the legal obligations set out in the agreements made originally with Cardi Ramsgate Limited. This includes the option agreement which gives the council the right to buy back the property if the development does not reach specified milestones within the agreed time frame. Thank you. Councillor Savage, do you have a supplementary? Well, of course I do. <laughs> Against this, does he feel it would be prudent for the council to ring-fence ring the £3 million uh, cover to, necessary to cover the necessity to repossess the site if it becomes necessary? Thank you. Leader, please. Yeah, I'd... I was down in Ramsgate on Wednesday night and I promised to go down and, and, and talk to uh, community groups about what the situation was with Pleasure Armour and interestingly enough this was one of the questions that came up and I would have to say that the residents of Ramsgate here were there, uh, uh, some had one view, some had another. Some wanted it ring-fenced, others wanted uh, what was there to be spent to be spent on other projects so that even if that sat still undeveloped for a while other things were able to flourish and move forward. Um, up until going on Wednesday night, I had always said that we would ring fence that money for spending on projects in Ramsgate. If there is a big call in Ramsgate to hold on to it in the hope of maybe needing to buy it back, we will look at that again. But right now, I would say that we will probably stick with looking for projects in Ramsgate. So there's some good news to come out of what's happened there, perhaps for the first time in many, many years. Agenda item number eight, motions on notice. Please note that no motions on notice have been received in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 3. Agenda item number nine, then, is the Leader's Report. I call upon the Leader. Thank you. Uh, as the administration here in Thanet, and uh, I did so recently, I'm often asked what uh, our purpose would be particularly post June the 23rd, seems to be a popular question amongst media commentators and others. And I suppose my, uh, my answer is twofold, one to do with Brexit and the other to do with uh, the circumstances here. And that our purpose here has to be to be different from the Labour and Tory administrations that have uh, gone before us, whose persistent combined messes we keep having to clear up. This statement relates very closely to the first three items on the Leader's Report this evening where my role to date, and indeed the Cabinet's role to date, has generally simply been to field the hospital past given to us by previous administrations. There can be little doubt, to return to Councillor Savage's question from a different direction, that the Pleasure Armour saga of the seafront in Ramsgate is one of the most shiny examples of political ineptitude undertaken by a variety of administrations going back to the mid-1990s. 
Councillor Iris Johnson, in spite of her poor record of decision making in this council, is still a member of this chamber. As deputy leader in the early years of this century, she oversaw a prospectus for this development hawked around potential investors in the City of London, which included the sale of the freehold from day one. And then spent 13 years denying her intention until in 2015 she achieved her aim with proud newspaper photographs, the Margate councillor who sold Ramsgate Seafront. Sold it proudly just two months before the election, deservedly threw out her toxic and dysfunctional administration on its ear. Not all smiles, because uh, Councillor Bateman had a little bit of involvement in all this as well, as the man who oversaw the negotiations that admitted to put a stop date on the development contract, creating chaos around sensible negotiation of this for some years, and that should also be noted. As I said, here in Thanet, our main purpose has to be to be different from Labour and Tory, whose persistent combined messes we keep having to clear up. Because then we move on to Dreamland. Compulsory purchased in 2011 under Councillor Bayford. We're fighting the battle of compensation to this day, and you'll see some of it spilled over into the public arena just in the last week or two. Handed on by Councillors Johnson and Hart's crew to a clearly undercapitalised operator whose vision and understanding of what drives the leisure business <coughs> seem to be somewhat short sighted, and nearly as inept as the contract negotiated by Labour on behalf of residents. The end result is a twice insolvent operator in just over a year. Here in Thanet, our purpose has to be different from Labour and Tory, whose persistent messes we keep having to clear up. Then there's the local plan, an evidence-based document which officially began in 2011 but is still not complete. The Council must produce this plan to convince planning inspectors there's a good cause for our land use decisions. Currently, the Manston Airport site is purely reserved for aviation, but the airport has been closed for two years and we needed to show evidence to maintain that in any emerging plan we could stick with that aviation use only. This was the background to the Commissioning of Report on Airport Viability by Specialist Consultancy Avia. Avia met with both River Oak and Sir Roger Gale to understand their view of the sustainability of fre freight hub operations at Manston yet still concluded that airport operations at Manston are very unlikely to be financially viable in the longer term. River Oak have now had four chances to impress. They failed as an indemnity partner in 2014. They failed as an indemnity partner in 2015. They failed to take advantage of a city financier who was seeking to invest £150 million and have now failed to demonstrate their case to Avia as well. I am saddened for the campaigners whose battle to maintain their dream of an airport has been both valiant and brave. Manston has an important heritage, but any future for that airport has to be evidenced with real numbers, something River Oak have signally failed to produce to date. Any mixed-use designation does not exclude aviation <coughs> use, so River Oak need to pull some serious evidence out of the bag in the coming weeks to demonstrate the potential for a working airport. Two rounds of soft market testing, reports on viability, the lack of interest from recognised players in the aviation marketplace all demand an answer. So it really is time for Rurok to show whether they can or cannot produce a serious business case for an airport. Otherwise, in the words of Tory Chancellor Philip Hammond only a few days ago, when times change, we must change with them. Balancing the books in any council is a challenge. A lethal combination of growing demand, austerity cuts and rising costs makes producing the legally required balanced budget tough. In fact, that task made harder by some of the decisions that we have inherited, as indicated. In common with many councils, we look to see if there are any assets it would be advantageous to sell to fund our capital programme. The building and improvement works our area so desperately needs. To that end, we held an extraordinary cabinet to open an initial tranche of possible asset disposals which then undertook a three-week public consultation before they returned to Cabinet for decision. The collective rationale for this list is that virtually all of them are either currently leased or had inquiries for leases, transfers, community or other uses. And therefore, we know that there is some market possibility for different ownership. So far, so good, one might think. Identify some unused or underused assets to fund other works. Normal business for any landowner with cash flow to manage by funding capital expenditure and reducing maintenance costs at the same time. 
I went into the picture, told a gentleman called Craig McKinley, using House of Commons notepaper, taxpayer-funded postage and envelopes, stoking the image of fire sales supported by his own invented numbers of 350 flats at Joss Bay. In a sweep of hubris that would shame Pinocchio's nose, our local MP has simply demonstrated his inability to understand genuine public consultation, rather than the pretense that people have been used to before. If we had really wanted to make building use of these sites, then logic says maximise the value by getting plan and permission before sale, which of course has not happened because that is not the purpose of the consultation, which genuinely seeks public views. If at the end of the consultation the view is that we should do everything we can to protect the green wedge and farmland, then that is fine. Such an opinion also informs future sites which may be considered. If so, then the question is whether to sell with covenants, which may mean no sale at all if the value becomes less than the agricultural lease rental, and we move on. In reports to Council, we have to make all the options clear. And particularly if we're going to take an option which is less than the greater cash return of development land, we have to show under the Localism Act that residents understand that is what we are doing on their behalf. Because here in Thanet, our purpose must be different from that of Labour and the Tories, whose persistent goodbye messes we keep having to clear up. I would like to have updated you on the Thames Estuary proposals and the five council merger, but sadly I've run out of time. The Brit aggregate extension, worthy of update, but we all heard at the last meeting how important the constitutional deadline is to other party leaders, and that only happened this week. Most interesting of all, just yesterday, two of the stalwarts of old party politics here in this chamber, one Labour, one Tory, donned ceremonial robes of office to prance around North Down Park, abusing their ceremonial positions in pursuit of political campaigning. One of whom will apparently go to any length to protect any asset in Margate, but devoted many years of her life to selling Ramsgate Seafront down the Swanee. That's old politics. Politics which denigrates all our reputations in this chamber. But of course, I can't tell you about it because it happened only yesterday and the other group leaders could not be given the requisite five days' notice, which one of these perpetrators yesterday so strongly advocated as a change to our constitution. The same woman who decried independent members assisting our council because she could not bear to hear them tell the truth. In the constitution of this council, the reputation of this council, the decision-making of this council, the legacy of this council, our job is to be different from Labour and the Tories whose persistent combined messes we are still having to clear up. Thank you very much, Councillor Wells. I call upon Councillor Bayford to comment on or ask questions in relation to the Leader's report. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I think that that speech was quite astonishing, really. Um, it wasn't that long ago that this council um, achieved notoriety for being uh, a fairly unpleasant chamber. Um, and I thought that we'd reached an accord that there would be some attempt at some kind of harmony, some cross-party working. What we've just heard is absolutely disgraceful. It's put this council back such a long way. And... I'm, I find it incredible that Councillor Wells can use the word hubris about other people. His arrogance and hubris knows absolutely no bounds whatsoever. Now, I have to say that when he was in our administration, which he conveniently forgets, he was part of the collective responsibilities for the decisions that he's now rubbishing. So I don't know what the definition of hypocrisy is, but I think that could be there somewhere. The other thing is that I've got to say that when he was a member of our group, I think a less likely UKIP person will go a long way to see. What you've got there is a carpetbagger who crossed the floor purely for his own personal gain and nothing else. What he also does, he conveniently forgets the loyalty of those people that stood by him when we had the situation of having a cabinet member that couldn't attend council meetings because he was in arrears with his council tax. And then he talks about people's financial incompetence. How on earth can he do this? It's just stunning. I'm glad that he did mention the airport, though. I'm glad that he did that, because you were elected almost solely on the promise of planes flying again from Manston. 
But for over a year now, everybody's noticed that you've gone a bit cool on the idea. Nobody's quite sure why, but you have. But you've also rushed to embrace the AVI report with remarkable alacrity. But the facts are that a report commissioned about two years ago by this council actually concluded that it could be viable to run an airport at Manston, provided there was somebody prepared to invest significant capital sums. Well, I've got news for you, Councillor Wells. There is somebody. It's River Oak. They are prepared to do that. They weren't prepared to show the detailed plan to your consultants, and I can understand that because of com confidential commercial or commercial confidentiality. Um, but the fact is that they've carried on. They've asked for no help from this council. They're seeking to put an airport back there. They're pursuing a DCO. And despite your election pledge, you've never once given any, uh, any effort to, to support their effort, not shown any support whatsoever. Um, I was at a presentation by one of the Avia consultants where he stated that experts who predicted a significant increase in air freight demand in the UK based their propositions on a hypothesis that he didn't accept. Now that tells me that had TDC picked a different consultant, they might have got a different result. They might have got a, a, a consultant that said that it could be viable, as the one two years ago did. I've got to tell you that my group believes that the dream of Manston being operational again still lives. Mm -hmm. I believe that there are many others in this chamber that share that dream, and I hope when the time comes they're brave enough to stand up and get counted. You can't play fast and loose with the electorate, Councillor Wells. You made a promise you've no intention of keeping. We made a promise we're sticking by. Thank you. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, the election is the election, and yes, you're quite right. There was uh, a promise made, certainly to do something within seven days to actually put the CPO in progress, and that was done on the very first night that we took office. And uh, I went, along with other colleagues, out of our way to give River Oak a second chance to present the case that they may actually put together. And uh, they failed abysmally on the process of proving that they had the ability to put the funds in place to be an indemnity partner. And the truth is, an indemnity partner only has one purpose, and that's to provide the money. And the one thing they could not do was get anywhere beyond proving that they could lay hands on more than £2 million. And in that circumstance, they were given a second chance and shortly afterwards a third chance, and now a fourth chance. And I hope that your optimism proves fruitful, and that on the fifth chance, when they operate the DCO with government, where the ability to actually provide proof is at a higher level than those that they've failed already, that they come out on top. Because actually, you're right. Many of us would like to see an airport at Manston, but I can't build a local plan on a dream. We have to build it on evidence. And if River Oak can't produce the evidence, we can't back River Oak. It's as simple as that. Call upon Councillor Matterface to comment on or ask questions in relation to the Leader's Report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, over on this side, the back row here, we didn't make promises. All we promised with regard to the airport that we would work with the current owners for the best result for Thanet. So, Let's put that one to bed. Uh, right. Firstly, Pleasure Armour, um, the meeting you held, you had uh, last week at Ramsgate uh, Town Council, the Labour Group welcomes your clear commitment to spending the receipts from Pleasure Armour in and for Ramsgate pro uh, projects. That has been very well received. Dreamland 2010, the CPO process started, and my understanding, Councillor Wells, is that you were part of the Conservative Cabinet at that time. I'd also like to remind you that it was the UKIP cabinet that signed off on the lease to the current uh, lessees at Dreamland. But I am concerned about the Dreamland project because the Labour Group representative on overview and scrutiny is still waiting for the scrutiny committee to be able to scrutinise uh, the Dreamland project and they are still waiting for the audit report to do so. In the Constitution, it states when five members from at least two parties ask for a report to come to scrutinise, uh, I'd like to ask why this is not yet happening. 
Um, on the local plan, we have a briefing, members briefing on Tuesday, and hopefully we will be able to hear when this plan is going to be finally put to bed. Because there is some concern among um, residents, but the fact the housing numbers that we're being given appear to be keep to keep rising. I understand it's gone up by another thousand recently. Um, and I also would like to remind him that the local plan was possibly delayed by a change of government, so hopefully we can speed that up a little bit. Then we'll all know where we are. Um, the asset disposal, um, I understand from speaking to some tenants, they knew absolutely nothing about the fact that where they were making a living was on an asset disposal list. So could I please ask that in future, when this comes to an extraordinary cabinet, that any tenant who is going to be affected at least has the, you have the courtesy of telling them this. Mm. Um, also, could we have a bit more notice of the extraordinary cabinet meeting? Because I had a holiday booked when you um, arranged that meeting, and I have been lambasted by a number of people for the fact that I wasn't present to speak on behalf of anybody who was involved with any of the assets that were planned. But I do have some concern. There's an awful lot of assets still to go, and if they're only going to be 22 at a time, each going out to consultation, could I ask how many consultations you anticipate having? Because there seems to be an awful lot to go through. If it's 22 for one meeting, and then another 22, or do you anticipate the process will speed up? Um, you did send, uh, when you sent out your list of subjects about the Kingdom enforcement contract, but I don't think you got to that. So if I can ask you a question, um, is there any chance of this contract coming back in-house? And as a supplementary to that, could I ask how much it actually costs Thanet District Council to have people finding uh, the public for um, dropping a cigarette, 80 pound a time? I would also, last time when we had a little bit debate about whether or not we should have got the information from you in advance rather than the Tuesday evening, I did say that the open top bus service was starting for the summer holidays and I'm very pleased as a member of the Thanet um, bus partnership group to say that uh, 15,000 fare paying passengers were carried during the six week period. Mm -hmm. There were a few problems with inconsiderate parking but our parking manager was on the case and next year because George Hill Road will be back open the bus will go from Margate station to um, the paddling pool at the far end of Ramsgate, so it will be a fully a full uh, a journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call upon the leader to respond, please. Uh, thank you. I think the key, the, the, the key point I think you were making there um, is essentially about the speeding up the process or whatever. Uh, we have something like 600 assets in total. There's no intention to try to get through all 600 this year. Uh, the, the target is 100, so that looks like four lists in the course of the next few months, which will give us time for the same level of consultation on each of those lists in order to uh, actually get through and see where we get to at the end of the financial year. So. Uh, the, uh, yeah, can you, I have a feeling I know who you're talking about, and if, if you, if, yeah, I do. And he did know, actually, because I, uh, I personally told him when, he was, uh, when we were on a little trip to the Somme the week or two before. So um, I, I find that interesting, and maybe we'll talk about that afterwards, if that's okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I call upon Councillor Eleanor to comment on or ask questions in relation to the Leader's report in the absence of Councillor Ashby. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I wasn't expecting this, but uh, uh, at the moment I'm rather short of, of troops. Uh, I will, I've listened carefully uh, to Leader's speech, and I will pass the... Uh, a synopsis of it to my non-existent other members. Uh, I'm in a very unfortunate position at the moment because, as you all know, in the political life, uh, God is on the side of the big battalions. He's not on my side at the moment. Thank you.
thank you. Thank you for your kind thoughts. Thank you very much, Councillor Wells. It goes towards the behaviour within the Chamber if we do remember to be respectful of everybody. And at this point, I'll pick up on a comment from Councillor Bayford. Uh, we do not wish to go back to the earlier days of... Um, so, but we don't wish to go back there. So I call upon Councillor Grove, please, to comment on or ask questions in relation to the Leader's report. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. I am in the fortunate position to have uh, one more in my army tonight, but uh, I think there's enough being said around the table, and it's nice to see a little bit of banter going backwards and forwards between the two leaders. So that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item... No, I'm sorry, you can't. No, I'm sorry, you can't. Agenda item number 10. No, no, I'm sorry. I think you need to sit down, Councillor Johnson. I am standing, you need to sit. I'm sorry, I'm standing, you need to sit or I will ask them to remove you. Please sit. Thank you. We do not wish to go back to where the council was. No, it is not. Agenda item number 10, the report of the Chairman of Overview and Scrutiny Panel. I call upon Councillor D. Saunders to present his report. Thank you, Chairman. Members, the report uh, that you find in your agenda pack this evening outlines the activities of the Overview and Scrutiny Panel and the working parties since we last met in July. As you will see, Councillor Hunter Stammer Smirsing attended the panel meeting on the 16th of August and gave an informative presentation on the Cabinet's view of the new economic development strategy for Thanet. And at the same meeting, the panel were given the opportunity of reviewing and commenting on the new events policy and procedures as part of the overall engagement and awareness process. Um, I have to say that that was uh, very interesting and some useful comments uh, were made by the uh, panel which uh, members uh, uh, would appreciate, particularly those members who um, are involved in organising... Um, events throughout the district. Members, in June, the Community Safety Partnership Working Party agreed a work programme which, as you will see in 2.2 on page 19, lists five key topics on which to focus their scrutiny efforts. In this connection, Acting Detective Chief Inspector Max Davidson from Kent Police Sexual Investigation Team, together with Chief Inspector Sharon Adley, attended the meeting on the 3rd of October to answer questions and address, which indeed they did, uh, members' concerns relative to the number of recorded sexual offences, the resulting convictions and the support services that are available to victims within Thanet. The working party will pursue that because there's some more information that they require and hopefully once we have all of the information together it will make a worthwhile uh, members briefing so that all members uh, are aware exactly what the situation is as i said it was a very informative meeting and i would urge and encourage members to note future uh, agenda topics and to take the opportunity of attending such working party meetings um, they tend not to be just talking shops, and uh, those who attended, Councillor Fairbrass and Councillor Johnson, um, found it very educational and very informative, and um, it would be useful to see more members there taking note of exactly the work that the scrutiny uh, working parties do. Members, following on from the peer review and for a trial period, Overview and Scrutiny have introduced public speaking at its meetings and in addition I would also confirm that in conjunction with democratic services we are considering recommendations to adopt a new scrutiny approach which we hope will enable the panel to plan and conduct their work more effect efficiently and add 
value to the decision-making process. At the moment, this is currently a work in progress, and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to re report in more detail at a future meeting. Thank you, members. I commend this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Saunders. Agenda item number 11, the annual Treasury Management Review 2015-2016. I call upon Councillor Townend. Thank you, Chairman. The annual Treasury Management Review 2015-16. This report summarises the Treasury management activity for 2015-16. It was approved by Governance and Audit Committee on the 22nd of June and Cabinet on the 28th of July. It is a backward look at the past financial year and sets out the interest paid on borrowing and earned on investments. As explained in Capita's review in Section 2 of the report, 2015-16 continued with the very low interest environment. Although it is too early to fully anticipate the longer-term impact of Brexit on interest rates, current commentators suggest that rates won't be rising significantly any time soon. I move that Cabinet approves the recommendations as set out. Thank you, Councillor Townend. Is there a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Stummer-Smertzing. Do members agree? Thank you. Agenda item number 12, changes to committees, panels and boards for 2016-2017 on the subject of proportionality. I call upon the leader to make a proposal in respect of the options as outlined in the report. I propose option one, Mr Chairman. Option one, thank you very much. Is there a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Lynn, Lynn Fairbrass. Does any member wish to propose an alternative option? Councillor Bayford, please. Option two, Chairman. Option two. So we have any further options, recommendations? Tony needs like a second. second. Option. I beg your pardon, a second. Thank you very much, Councillor Savage. Okay. I would like then, please, to request a show of hands in favour of option one. Thank you. Those in favour of option two, please. Are there any abstentions? Having achieved more than 50%. Thank you very much. Option one is carried. Nomination of members to serve on committees. Group leaders may take this opportunity to advise of their nominations to committees, panels and boards for the remainder of 2016-17 or alternatively advise democratic services after this meeting. I call upon the leader. Okay, I believe option one requires me to nominate an additional seat on uh, each of the committees. So, Councillor Connor for the Planning Committee, Councillor Howes for the Licensing Board, Councillor Ruziki for the Overview and Scrutiny Panel, Councillor Linda Piper for Governance and Audit, Councillor Linda Piper for General Purposes, Councillor Derek Crow Brown for the Boundary Electoral Arrangements Working Party, Councillor Ruziki for the Constitutional Review Working Party and Councillor Crow Graham for the Joint Transportation Board. Thank you.
Thank you. Councillor Bayford, do you wish to make any changes? Thank you. Councillor Matterface, do you wish to make any changes? Thank you. Councillor Eleanor, in the absence of Councillor Ashby. No changes, sir. Thank you. Councillor Grove. No changes. Thank you. Agenda item number Chairman. 30. Oh, yes, Councillor Grove. Question. Appear to have forgotten the JTB, which was a separate um, table on the agenda. For this item, can I call upon the leader to suggest his option? Uh, Councillor Wells, for clarity for the members, it's on page 45 at the top of the page. 41, I hope. On my copy, it's 45. Right. Can, can can you advise me why it's page 45, not page 41? Because I was on page 41. <laughs> Page 41 outlines um, the yes, yes. The table on option one is um, the proportionality calculations. You're quite right. The, the table five under, in the second line in the table should read option two. You're quite right. Yes, yes, yes. But the what those, the implications of those options are is explained at the top of page 45. Paragraph 4.73 or 4.75, depending on whether you want option one or option two. So we now call on the leader to, yep. so we call on, one yep. call on the leader to say, would you like option Councilor one? Councillor Wills, option please. Two? Option one option two? Uh, option one, please. Are there any other options being offered? Can you say that again? Because I'm not sure if people are listening. Are there any other options to be offered apart from the leader's recommendation for option one? Right. Councillor Cobrat. Thank you. We're done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Now I think we can move to uh, agenda item number 13, the standards hearing decision. And I call upon Mr. Howes, the Council's monitoring officer. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, you have a report to item 13 about a um, recommendations from a standards hearing subcommittee, and they recommended a number of sanctions in respect of Councillor Larkins 
and two of those sanctions are here tonight. One relates about um, receiving a public apology which should be read out at the meeting and the second relates to a, a form of censure which is the issue of an, unfa of an unfavourable opinion or judgment or reprimand. Now, you aren't here to consider the decision itself, merely the recommended sanctions. Um, I think it's important to say it should be a fairly binary decision whether you do or don't accept each individual sanction, and it's recommended we take them in turn, and that, uh, sub subject to what members think, is if there is a debate, the debate cannot be about the decision, it can only be about the sanctions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howes. I therefore propose that I, as Chairman of the Council, read out Councillor Larkin's apology, which is to be published in the minutes of this meeting. Is there a seconder, please? Councillor Grove, thank you. Do members agree? Thank you. I will now read out the apology from Councillor Larkins. I wish to offer an unreserved apology for any offence caused by the recent comment made by a Facebook account. I acknowledge this is not party policy and realise the comment risked blaming a whole religion for the activities of the few. I call upon Mr. Howes, the Council's monitoring officer. Thank you, Chairman. Again, moving to the second recommendation, which is about censuring Councillor Larkins. Again, just to be clear, this is about whether the Council does or does not adopt that particular sanction. It's not about the decision itself, which you've delegated to the Standards Committee to deal with. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I now propose that the Council censures Councillor Larkins for bringing her role as Councillor into disrepute. Would the Leader please second? Second, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Do members agree? Thank you. That concludes the business for the meeting of this Council. Thank you for everybody for your attendance.